All right, now that I feel happy with all the world building and the lighting that I did, it's a good time for final post-processing adjustments and the actual capture. In the post-processing, you want to make sure you adjust the exposure. In this case, I went with manual exposure and six stops of exposure compensation. Next, I disable lens flares by setting intensity to zero and we can look into ray tracing settings now. I kept GI as is because this scene doesn't rely on it that much. Now reflections, on the other hand, are being used heavily. So I increased maximum bounces to 2 and sample rate to 4. That should give nice looking result and should still run ok. Now include translucency in reflections is off and refraction is set to raster which is a non-RTX option. I think rest of the settings are ok and everything else is default. I also don't think that I need any major adjustments to color. Now before you launch Ansel you need to make sure that it's actually enabled and you can do that by going in the settings, plugins and typing NVIDIA. It should be enabled by default and if it's not you can do that here. It will ask you to restart the engine so make sure that you save your work before you do that. With Ansel enabled uh, what you need to do next is launch your scene as a standalone game and you can do that right here under play. Once you have it selected you can click on the play button. It will ask you to save your level and after that your scene will be loaded in a standalone window. You can navigate in here by moving your mouse and using WSAD or arrows. Also Q will pan down and E will pan up. Now I will navigate to the position which I want to be the center of my panorama. You want to make sure that you look around since uh, you will be capturing everything. And if everything looks good we can press Alt F2. First thing that you will probably notice is that everything looks unlit and that happens because by default F2 toggles unlit mode. To fix that you'll need to press F3 which will set it back to final render. Also F1 will toggle wireframe and F4 does lighting only. You can still move your camera with mouse and WSAD while you in Ansel but it will be significantly slower since it's mainly made for fine tuning your position. Let's quickly go over the options we have here. Filter type has a lot of different filters and effects that you can apply to your image. From simple stuff like sharpness to more complex effects like depth of field or green screen. Where you can isolate foreground of uh, your image by shifting focus plane. And you can actually change the color of the mask with the slider here. I'm not going to go over all of them because uh, I do think that they are very self-explanatory. And if you need to remove a filter, you just need to click on the little X. Styles are a bit less useful. You can turn your render to a very questionable oil painting, but uh, we won't do that in this tutorial at least. What we're actually going to do is go all the way down to capture type and move the slider until it says 360. Once you do that, you will get another option at the bottom where you can set the resolution of the capture. And I and will go all the way to 8K so that we get lots of room to work with. There's also an option to capture 32-bit high dynamic range image, but in this case I think it's going to be an overkill because we're not going to do any complex compositing afterwards. Now all that's left is to click snap and let it render. Once the capture is complete you can hit escape on your keyboard and go back to regular mode, reposition your camera and capture anything else from another 360 to some supporting screenshots. We can close this window now since we don't need it anymore and let's navigate to location of our capture and check how it end up looking. By default your captures will be saved under your username, videos and real engine demo. There are multiple ways you can preview this image now and you can always look at it unwrapped and in most cases it's enough to judge the quality and the sharpness of details but of course we didn't capture a panorama to look at it as a flat image with lots of distortion. So to preview this image as a spherical panorama, you will need to use Photoshop or a standalone software. I personally like to use this one. It's used to preview images from a 360 camera and you can download it for free. Just make sure that it says basic app. Once you launch it, you can use file open or simply drag and drop your image in here. Left mouse button will let you look around and the middle button can zoom in and out of the panorama. And if you took multiple shots, you can use these arrows at the bottom to load other 360s that are in the capture folder. So as you can see I have a few different shots in here. And that is actually all there is to it. 
From here, you can present it as it is, or you can take it to Photoshop for some extra paint over, which is what I'm going to do next. There are two ways you can work with 360 images in Photoshop, and I will be using both of them to get this concept done because each has its own benefits. First and the most straightforward approach would be to paint on the unwrapped image as you normally would, and use a 360 perspective grid like this one to know where and how much to compensate for distortion. This is the best approach for major image adjustments like all your color correction or anything that's not affected by distortion like adding film grain for example. One thing to keep in mind is that whatever you do here has to tile left to right. So make sure that you use offset to check for seams and blend anything that has a hard line, otherwise it will show up in the panorama. Another approach you can use and a preferable one for actual painting would be turning this into a spherical panorama under a 3D tab. So I'm going to choose new panorama layer from selected layers. And as you can see, I can now look around uh, using my left mouse button and under current camera in the 3D tab, you can change the field of view. Usually I like to keep it pretty wide. Uh, this will make it much easier to paint without thinking too much about uh, distortion. One thing that you will notice right away is that the image got a little pixelated. This is normal because it's just a preview. You can test that by double clicking on the spherical map under the base color. It will open up original image in the separate window and as you can see it has its full resolution. So if you try to paint directly on this layer, it will work of course, but you will get some noticeable delay. And the way to fix that is simply by creating a new layer and painting on top of that layer instead. So far so good, right? Well, except that now when you move the camera, whatever you painted will not align until you merge it down with the underlying layer. And that's the only downside of this workflow, I think. Once you merge your layers, you can double click on the spherical map again and all the changes that you painted should all be there. From here, you can duplicate this layer into your main file and that way you can have some sort of a non-destructive workflow. For the rest of the painting time-lapse, I will be using these two techniques and the painting itself is pretty straightforward. I edited the video so that it doesn't take too long, plus no one has to watch me obsessively choose what brushes to use for waves and splashes. First thing that I did before anything else was making a mask for the sky and painting out most of the clouds since I wanted it to look like thick stormy clouds. I made a mask by grabbing blue channel of the original image and crashing its contrast until most of the sky gets nicely isolated. Painting out the sky created a hard line where the image tiles, so I had to use offset to paint on top a bit until the line is uh, blended. You always need to be cautious for stuff like this, don't forget that panoramas have to tile horizontally. Painting some more foam and splashes, I have a few reference pictures on the second monitor to help me get it right. A lot of it is about trying to get shapes that have energy. Using the right brushes can help a lot with that. In general, I tend to pick brushes that have similar texture and hardness to whatever I'm trying to paint. So for the ocean, I was moving between a few different brushes. Some are harder, with a lot of random noise to help create that turbulence and chaos uh, that you have in the waves. And some other brushes are softer to get that mist-like effect where smaller water droplets are being carried by the wind. I paint in general shapes first and do shading later. That way it's a bit easier, uh, you only have to focus on getting one thing right instead of trying to get color value and shape all at once. I try to paint most of it in the unwrapped view, so usually everything in the center of the frame will have less distortion. It's basically just a very extreme one-point perspective.
and for stuff like splashes under the boat and basically for everything in the foreground, I had to switch to spherical panorama and move the camera while painting each viewing angle at a time. I usually like to think ahead of how I'm going to cover a certain area, how many times I would have to move the camera and in this case, for example, to cover the entire length of the boat, I had to do back, center and front all separately while making sure it all blends together. Because you can only fit so much even with a very wide field of view. To help me blend everything nicely, I always keep a bit of painting from the previous view, so basically trying to overlap, uh, that way I can just continue painting from where I left off. I actually messed up a little when I was painting smoke on the mid-ground boat. It was so close to the top so it actually had to warp if I wanted it to look straight in the actual panorama view. And you need the 360 grid to help you visualize distortion like this and I knew that but completely ignored for some reason. So of course I painted it straight in this view and then it was uh, warping a little bit in the panoramic view. After I got Ocean to a point that made me relatively happy, I started fixing the render look that everything has uh, by painting out some of the details and fixing these not so great looking characters. I crashed some of the exposure and masked the areas that I wanted to be the focus. I'm mostly using values here to define my focal points. And I usually like to have at least two focal points in the panorama. 
so that way it motivates viewer to look around. Birds were photo bashed as well, but I had to split it up into three different sections. So the background birds, middle ground and the foreground. And the foreground birds have very different perspective because they're directly above us. So I had to use a different reference from which I actually created a custom brush which randomized a lot of the birds for me. And then I would go back and paint some highlights on top of them. The way I'm deciding on a lot of post-processing is dictated by the style I'm going for. So with the stuff like lens flares, if I choose to use them, it means that we're looking through the physical camera. So stuff like uh, lens dirt and film grain will look coherent together, which also means that I won't be adding a canvas texture, for example. I try to set those rules for myself, and if I'm doing a more painted look, I would avoid lens flares and film grain, for example. At least the way I see it, you can't have everything all together. You have to stick to either photographic or a cinematic look or more of a painterly look. And I'm not saying that it's impossible to blend it, but it's just a lot harder to do that, right? And, and for example, if I wanted to have a cinematic and painterly look at the same time, then I would most likely paint my lens flares in instead of using a photographic reference, for example. So the lightning was actually photo bash, and I just painted on top to have it sit nicer with the rest of the painting. So now I'm simplifying a lot of the textures in the foreground to take away from its visual weight so that it doesn't fight with the focal point. And that's actually it. Here's a little uh, before and after. And that concludes this tutorial. And if you do have any questions, leave a comment and I will make sure to reply when I can. I really hope you enjoyed this tutorial and learned something new. If you haven't already, please subscribe to NVIDIA Studio YouTube channel. Take care and I will see you next time.